And there you go. Welcome, everybody. So let's see. Let's just wait a couple more minutes. It seems like we still have a few people filtering in here. Looks like we have more than half, so that's great. Yeah, it is good. I told you guys there was a, a big need, and so this is going to be terrific. See if we can get to 100, and then we'll we'll get going. So I wish I could see everybody. I wish you could. Hey, how are you doing today? It's always so strange to look at a, a not a blank screen, but a screen without your your audience. Um, all right. So. Um, let me just make sure I get my participants up so I can see what's going on here. There we go. Very good. Okay. So I am Laura Burris. I'm the chair of biology and um, really happy to virtually see everybody here as you come into the room. And so Brianna, could I get to the next slide, please? Yes. So um, as I said I'm already, I'm, Bri um, I'm Laura Burris. I'm not Brianna Franklin, I'm Laura Burris. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's that time of day. That means you've been Zooming way too much in a day. Um, <laughs> I'm professor and chair of biology and I'm really pleased to introduce, um, I will just go down the list in order and let everybody introduce themselves and a little bit about themselves and then I'll take back over. So Brianna, you're on next. Hi everybody, um, I'm Brianna Franklin. I am the biology undergraduate specialist. Um, if you're here, you probably got an email from me inviting you to this. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to put a small couple things in the chat um, so you know when to ask questions and everything, but super excited everyone is here. Okay, Rachel. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Small. I am a lecturer of chemistry at San Francisco State, and I also direct the SF State Pre-Health Professions Postback Program. So I am a pre-health advisor, and I've been at SF State doing this for the past eight years. So I've seen hundreds and hundreds of students go through this process and you can do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. Lawrence? Hi everyone, I am Lawrence Henson. I am a fourth year medical student at UCSF. I am currently applying into where medical res into residencies into anesthesiology. And fun fact about me, I initially chose hospitality as my major of choice because it had the word hospital in it. I thought that was the major to choose for medicine. That, that's such a great story, Lawrence. And it just shows that, that, you know, we all carry our misconceptions and then we learn and we move forward. So now we're on the anesthesiology. Luke. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Luke Kim. Um, I'm also a medical student at UCSF. I'm in my, uh, this is my first year though. Um, and I just graduated from California State University Bakersfield. Um, so I'm somewhat familiar with the, the CSU system and the, the process. Um, and a fun fact, uh, hmm. well, I, I used to live in a small town in central Washington called Yakima, which I think is pretty out of the way. <laughs> Very good. And then we have Winter Luna. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Winter Luna. I'm a second year medical student at AUC, which is the American University of the Caribbean, and that is in St. Martin. So I got to spend almost two years um, in St. Martin before I had to come back due to COVID. Um, and I went through the CSU system as well. Um, fun fact about me, uh, I am a black belt in Taekwondo. So if you ever want to, you know, Spar? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's it for me. Very good. And then last but not least, Jeremy. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Jeremy Miller. Uh, I am a third year medical student at Ross University um, and a second year MPH student at University of Illinois at Chicago. So two different programs, two different schools. Um, and I went to SF State, graduated in 2018. And fun fact, before going back to school, because I was a non-traditional student, um, I almost went to culinary school instead of going to SF State. <laughs> I decided to pursue 
pre-med and molecular biology at SS State and now happy that I made that decision. Very good. Um, and so I see some questions going into the chat box. So first, welcome to all the panelists and thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come um, talk with us. And so I see some questions in the chat box about, um, you know, where do we get advising and who does that? And so basically, and I, some of you are biology majors and maybe some of you aren't, but if you're a biology major, then you can get advising in the biology department through your regular advisors and they will have some information for you. There will also be um, continued webinars that Brianna, bless her, she's right here, has been working really hard to roll out this year. And so we'll be continuing to have more webinars and there will be a follow-up to this one. And um, in the spring, we're offering a new course called SCI, SCI for Science 239, that is an introduction to health professions. And this course will be taught by a podiatrist, a pra practicing podiatrist, who's one of our awesome instructors. So those are some avenues that you can take for general advising. If you want to contact the chair of biology, you can contact me at biology at sfsu.edu. OK, so Brianna, take it away. All right. And I guess I would encourage people to put questions for the panel into the Q&A instead of into chat. OK. Yeah. Oop, oop, too much, too much. <laughs> Sorry, everybody, let me get myself situated. Come on. When do I go back? Okay, can everyone see that now? Yeah. All right, good. sorry about that. Okay, so one of the first questions you might have um, is what major should I pursue um, if you're interested about going into medical school? So there is no required undergraduate major for students um, or minors for that matter, if you wish to apply to medical schools. Um, there are some prerequisites. Um, you can look at it um, school by school. So obviously you want to research the schools that you want to apply to. Um, so definitely research your schools um, and see what requirements they have. Um, and then of course, see if you can take them here. Um, I also have a list of some um, kind of prerequisites requirements. Um, and I can send that out to everyone after this. Um, a suggested site that you might want to look at is this site here um, for U.S. Allopathic Medical Schools. Um, so they have some requirements listed here. Next. So another thing that you'll probably be looking into is volunteering. Um, so this is a very large list of uh, places you can think about volunteering at. Um, all of these are based around the Bay Area. Um, so if you're not in the Bay Area right now, which probably a lot of you aren't, um, you can definitely look at similar places where you are. Um, so clinics, medical centers and hospitals, nonprofit organizations, volunteer centers. Um, so I won't go through all of these, um, but one thing we kind of want to point out is, I put it in the volunteer center section, is it doesn't have to be a medical centered volunteering experience. So you can volunteer at um, a women's shelter, um, any, anywhere like that. So any kind of volunteering experience will be helpful to you. Um, so volunteer applications, they do differ. Um, but prepare to submit. You may not need as many of these. You need to submit one or all the following. Um, so you'll want to have a resume, a possible cover letter, um, and then a possible letter of recommendation. 
So again, we'll hopefully I'll I'll send this out to you guys later on the slideshow so you can have a list of all these um, volunteering opportunities. So a first poll that we wanted to do um, is what academic year are you thinking of entering medical school? Um, so when I say that, I don't mean when do you think you're going to start applying, but when do you think you will be starting medical school? Um, let me bring that poll up for you guys. So I listed it as academic year. So for a reference, we're in the 2020-2021 academic year. All right, so we're getting a lot of people in. Okay, just a few more people, get your votes in. And of course, if you're not sure, I get it. Um, so we listed that there for you as well. All right, let's get a couple more, couple more in, and then we'll end it here. All right, that's pretty good, 93% of you. So looking like the majority of you are looking at 2022 to 2023. Um, 2023, 2024, 2024 to 2025. Okay, so keep these academic years in mind um, as we go through kind of the application timeline. Um, we'll have another poll to see when you think you need to start applying. I'll share those results so you guys can see it as well. All right, so keep those in mind and we'll keep moving forward. Okay, so one of the first things that's probably in your mind um, when you think of starting to apply for medical school is the MCAT. Um, so studying for the MCAT can vary for everybody, um, but the first thing you might wanna look at is when you're researching your schools that you wanna to apply to, see what your school's requirements are. Some schools, they no longer require you to take the MCAT. This isn't for every single school, so do your research um, and see which schools actually require it and which ones don't. Uh, most students study around three to four months um, for the MCAT. Um, some, not every single student, uh, enroll in test prep classes. Um, Princeton Review, Kaplan Berkeley Review, those are just a few um, of the prep classes that are out there. Um, but probably for some of you that are thinking of applying sooner, um, at this point, you kind of know what type of learner you are. Um, so think about that when you're starting to study for your MCAT. You may need to give yourself a little bit more time. You may need those test prep classes. Um, but take the time that you need. Um, obviously, this is a, it's, it's a big test. Um, and you don't want to go in without the, um, the right tools and without being prepared. Um, and then there is an additional resource there. Um, for how to prepare for your MCAT. And so we'll jump into the timeline. So this is a, it's a, a general timeline. Um, it could change. Um, and this is kind of looking at if you're going to be entered in a fall term, um, which most of you, that's probably what you're going for. Um, so around April and May of the year before your desired start term, um, this is pretty much a year before 
Um, you should be taking the MCAT or you've already taken the MCAT. Um, you're just waiting for your score. The AMCAS, which is the American College Application Service, um, that application should be available. Um, you can start filling out the primary application. Um, so there's a link there. Um, that has some good information in there as well, um, a lot of dates. Um, you will order and collect all your official transcripts from all colleges and universities that you've attended. Um, and then, like I said, confirm the deadline dates for AMCAS um, and other medical schools. Um, so most medical schools, you'll do it through AMCAS, but some have their own application process. Um, so look at that when also you're researching your schools. Um, and then focus on your finals. If you're already um, an alumni, so you're out of your um, undergrad or out of whatever degree, um, continue to work, volunteer, et cetera, all that good stuff. And then around June of the year, before your desired start term, you'll make your final decisions on which medical schools to apply to, submit your primary application, um, actually send your official transcripts to AMCAS. Um, so these are transcripts from all, all the courses you've taken. So at a community college, um, at a university, if you transfer for another university, all those transcripts you'll have to send over. Um, you'll have your letters of recommendation sent to AMCAS as well. Um, and then they'll verify the primary application. And then medical school's decisions regarding secondary applications begin to be forwarded to applicants. And then around July of the year before your desired start term, um, the verification process is still going on. Um, we'll be notified of the verified primary applications or problems with birth verification. Um, decisions regarding secondary applications will be sent out to applicants. Um, and then you'll also during the time be continuing to submit your primary applications. And then around August of the year before, um, you'll continue finishing and submitting your secondary applications. So it's a, kind of like a two-step application process. All right, so this is a bigger span of time. So August of the year before your desired start term through March and April, right before your desired start term. So now we're in the year of when you will actually be attending, hopefully. Um, so you will prepare and attend interviews, um, continue to complete and submit secondary applications. Um, always check that website, the AMCAS, to see when those deadlines are. Send medical school application updates if acceptable. Continue to check the medical school application status website for each individual medical school. Um, so they might differ, they might all not be the same. Um, and so October the year before desired start term to, to May of your desired start term, medical school admissions committees meet and decide status and then you're, you will be notified. Okay, so March and May before your desired start term, so now we're in the year. Um, medical schools will hold a second look or at meet weekend activities. Um, right now, obviously, those would be virtual, but we'll see when you actually are admitted how that looks. Hopefully, we'll, things will be in person again. Um, newly admitted applicants are invited to attend these um, activities. Um, and then May of that year, um, Newly admitted applicants must notify AMCAS and the medical school that they plan to matriculate their decision by May 15th. Um, and then if you had multiple acceptances, you must choose one school by May 15th as well and withdraw your application from other schools. All right, so May through August, so right before your start term, 
applicants on the waitlist are notified of an admission offer. Um, medical schools usually convert their classes by the end of June. Um, August through September, so right before fall start term, or right of fall start term, um, medical school orientation in the school year will begin. Um, so if you are on a wait list, um, you can no longer be offered a position at another school once the orientation begins at medical school. So you have to choose one by then. Um, financial planning is important. Um, so keep that in mind when you're starting this application process. Um, I've heard from one of our panelists that it costs them around $3,000. Um, so definitely keep that in mind. Um, when you're planning, keep them on the finance side as well. Oh, now our second poll, considering this timeline, what academic year do you think you'll need to start applying? So think of back to the beginning of the timeline, take a few minutes to think. Um, it's a well, it's actually a little bit longer than a year. So think about your original time that you wanted to actually start um, and what you think the academic year that you'll need to start applying. So I will launch the second poll. Um, go ahead and keep thinking though. I'll let this one go a little bit longer. Take about another about 30 seconds here. Okay. So I'll go ahead and end this one. So it's looking like most of you are, are correct. Um, so the 2021, 2022, 2022, 2023, that was about a, um, a year before our most popular vote um, for the first poll. So yeah, I think this is like a, a year long process, maybe even more um, if you're thinking about taking the MCAT as well. Um, so definitely keep that in mind when you're looking at medical schools or you're thinking about your finances, your options, what you wanna do. Um, so here are a couple of on-campus resources. So things you can use at um, SF State. We will be launching a pre-health website. Um, it will be on the career services page. Um, so this will have different links to um, different pre-health careers um, and the different pathways to that. So not even just medical school, but anything related to pre-health. Um, academic tools, of course, we have our academic advisors in biology. Um, most of them have a little bit of pre-health kind of pre-med training. Um, so they should be able to answer some of your questions. Um, the College of Science and Engineering Student Success Center. Um, if you have questions about even just general ed, um, shoot your questions to them. Obviously you need to get through 
Um, if you're in your undergrad, you need to get you through your undergrad first. So we want to make sure you're on the right path. Um, make connections with your instructors. Um, even when you're thinking about volunteering or just medical school in general, you need those letters of recommendation. Um, so definitely those coming from a relevant instructor will be great. Um, next semester, spring 2021, Laura briefly mentioned this. Um, we will have side 239, a pre-health professions class. Um, so look out for that, just in case you want to see what else is out there um, when it comes to health careers. Um, SF Build, Building Infrastructure Leading to Diversity. Um, there's their website there, but you can also just search SF Build. Um, they have a lot of opportunities um, that you can look into. Um, yeah, so when it comes to, I think they have volunteer, some internships. Um, I think there might even list some jobs on there as well. So all good resources that you can use here. And with that, um, we will jump into our panel discussion. Um, I see a good amount of questions in our Q&A, which is awesome. Um, I see a couple of raised hands. Um, so if you have a question, um, please continue to put those in the Q&A box. Um, yeah. And Brianna, why don't we have each of our panelists just take a minute to kind of say what one thing they know now that they wish they had known when they were applying for medical school. So one tip that you sure. would like to give people and then we'll go into some more kind of specific questions. So um, I'm just going to go in the order of people on my screen. So Luke, why don't you start us off? One thing you know now that you wished you had known when you were applying. Oh, uh, so, <laughs> putting you on the spot. Yeah. Um, or just something that was important. It doesn't have to be the one thing. Yeah, well, uh, I think, I mean, I, I feel like one thing that I thought about a lot was um, I think coming from like the Cal State system, I, I felt like I had different ideas of what like a competitive applicant was. And um, I think as long as you're uh, making the effort to actually like, you know, build relationships and be involved in whatever activities you're doing, whether it's on campus or out, um, out in, you know, the community. Um, I, I don't think that I felt um, that like coming from the Cal State system was ever like it. I don't know, like a disadvantage in any way. Um, although I think I, I did have like, uh, like ideas about what like a, um, a successful applicant profile looked like, but um, yeah, so. Okay, thank you. That's it. Jeremy, how about you? What's one thing you know now that you wish to have known when you were applying? Um how good study habits made in undergrad can carry you through your first couple years of medical school. Um, just like, I mean, some of the biology that we learned was very similar to taking like our introduction biology class. I mean, the, some of the, the concepts in medicine are so simple, I guess from, I, I did, I was a molecular major. So I feel like, you know, compared to molecular biology, like some of the concepts were a lot easier to understand, but just being able to prioritize studying and um, how to tackle like a large amount of course load is like super important to develop as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Winter, how about you? Um, I think it's a really good question <laughs> because um, I think as physicians or, you know, we, I think the profession is so glamorized and glorified in a sense. And that's, I think what a lot of people think uh, going in and I felt the same way and I heard people talk about it in that way. Um, but it takes a lot of determination. It does take a lot of grit and it takes a lot of perseverance. And I think um, if you can find it within yourself to you know, um, have that determination, that perseverance. Um, it is wonderful to be in this profession, but it's not for the faint of heart. And I'll, I'll tell, I'll be honest with you all there because it, it's, it's really hard, but it's well worth it in the end. All right, thank you. And Lawrence. I think that's a good question. 
the uh, best advice I could give is to really focus on yourself. Try not to let what other people post online bog you down. It's very easy to get hung up on what gets posted online as to what an I quote unquote ideal candidate would be for medical school. Focus on what you love and why you're why you want to pursue medicine and don't let the other people drag you down, especially those posting on student doctor network. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there's so many messages we get about what the ideal candidate looks like. And as we know, the messages in the media are sometimes lopsided and present only one side of the picture. And we really want to have um, uh, med students and doctors that really represent our communities. So don't be dissuaded by what you see out there in terms of representations. Um, I want to go next to reading through the Q&A here to um, Rachel. So there was a question that a number of people had about what clubs are available for students to participate in. Well, sure. Uh, so the club act activity can vary a little bit in terms of which clubs are very active. Um, but I think, uh, I think there's a new app or a new um, website that you have that's called the Gator Experience that will tell you a lot about the current clubs. Um, but currently, the ones that I've noticed are the most active right now, you can actually go on either org sync or on that Gator Experience and see um, which ones are listed. But there are is um, pre health professions student alliance, which is sometimes goes by FIPSA. Uh, MedLife, I saw actually in the chat, that's another one, um, Globe Med, um, the pre-pharmacy club is really active as well for, I saw a couple people are pre-farm, um, and the pre-physician assistant club is um, also really active. There's pre-health honor society, which I've, I've seen recently, but um, yeah, I think Globe Med, MedLife, uh, SACNIS definitely have all been really active recently, but yeah, I would ch recommend checking out, like I said, that Gator experience and seeing who's posting there. Terrific. And Lawrence, you used to be the uh, president of one of the clubs, did you not? I was. I used to be the president of PIPSA, actually. Okay. So. <laughs> and what kinds of things did they, you do in PIPSA? So the cool thing that we did in PIPSA was that doing a little bit of uh, advertising for PIPSA here, but uh, we did a lot of workshops as to basically working out your application for medical school, putting together your CV, putting together your letters of intent and being able to network with professionals, physicians and researchers in the field of medicine. We also had funding opportunities as well as blood donations. So it's a great way to get connected with like-minded individuals and people who can offer a lot of opportunities for you to be more involved in extracurricular activities. All right, thank you. Um... So I'm just kind of scrolling through the questions here, trying to find some common themes. Another big theme that maybe many of you could speak to, I'll let you guys choose who to answer, is um, what kind of volunteer opportunities did you take when you were um, considering applying to medical school? And to your knowledge, what types of opportunities are still available during COVID? Yeah, I, uh, I can speak to that a little bit. I saw many <laughs> questions asking about the volunteer opportunities right now. And I think all of you are in such a unique situation because what I did was awesome, um, obviously in person. I, I was a medical scribe at a clinic in Bayview. Um, I also did the UCSF PUP program or the pre-health undergraduate program at UCSF and that where we learned how to uh, design clinical um, um, we had a clinical experience in designing, um, I'm I like blanking on the word that I'm needing, but, um, <laughs> anyway, if you want to look it up, it's UCSF PUP, um, you can, uh, apply there. I know they got their program, uh, program up and running again. Um, and I would say because of those things not being available right now, um, I'm not sure what is available, but, I would recommend um, going to several conferences that are virtual right now. I know it's probably really tough and it may not be the perfect system, um, but I know SACNAS just had a huge conference um, available um, virtually. And um, I know UC Davis had their pre-health conference 
uh, virtually as well. And that's really where I would recommend first just going and making those connections with people, um, getting to talk to people. Um, and oh, some other things I had uh, that I wanted to mention. There are certain certifications that you can get online uh, just by just going on and um, looking at the material and taking some questions or some tests such as like psychological first aid and there you can go on I can I can link the website and you all can go on and get certified um, you know and I think that some of those programs are really awesome just in terms of being in the state that we're in right now in a pandemic and learning how to deal with um, certain situations um, you know that that arise and how how to deal with that and so I can help by listing some of those things Anybody else? Uh, I can speak on that. Um, I, I volunteered extensively through um, SF General at the time, but now it's Zuckerberg. Um, so they have a lot of great volunteer opportunities in a wide number of departments. Um, so depending on what your health interests are, you can definitely find a position within the organization. Um, the best thing would be to reach out to the volunteer department and see what is currently going on. Um, during my time there, I used to volunteer in the trauma center overnight, um, and then I got transferred down to the OR. And so I would, you know, spend two days a week in the OR for six to eight hours and just helping with like traumas. And um, so it was great hands-on experience that uh, showed that, you know, you were really interested. Also, California Medical Center or California Pacific Medical Center um, also has a lot, a lot of volunteer opportunities for students. Um, surgery opportunities, uh, you know, being on the floors, um, pediatric volunteer uh, opportunities. So, um, and also your local community organizations. I know in San Francisco, there's a ton of local health clinics, a lot of great outreaches in each individual community. So, I mean, I say, look at your own community and see what's close to you, because those are going to be the easiest places to volunteer at. You're going to be able to connect with the people more. And I think it, those are the Medical schools want to see that you're invested in giving back to your community. Um, so check some of those out. And I'm going to pipe in um, that I actually have an institutional membership to the Rotary Club. And the Rotary Club is a service club that actually has a connection to um, healthcare as well called Rotacare. And so if anybody wants to connect to Rotacare, I can help hook you up with them. Oh, one last thing. Sorry. Uh, Stanford actually has a program called LEAP. It's called Leadership Education for Aspiring Physicians, and you apply to it, and it's about diversity and, and healthcare and for future physicians, um, and it's basically like an eight-month uh, project series to where you basically look at a public health problem and you investigate it, and then you present your project in front of um, like a board of Stanford physicians and like other students in your program, and um, I think they are currently still accepting people, um, and it's like they do a cohort every year. And it was a great way to get involved in. Um, so yeah, check that out too. I'll put it in the chat too. Thanks. Anybody else? The answer. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I can definitely uh, just to echo uh, Jeremy's uh, mention of Leap. I also did participate in Leap, and I can speak very highly about the program's ability to give you opportunities to be involved in community in your community program. So, would definitely recommend checking it out. Terrific. Thank you, guys. So there's a ton of opportunities out there. And I think uh, one thing that I think it was Jeremy that said, just look for opportunities in commu community, you know, even uh, food banks, you got to have food to be alive, that is a health issue. And so things that um, just basically um, involve human well being are all health issues. And so to think very broadly about it, and to find your passion, and to do something that you feel really strongly and passionate about, because um, that's where you're gonna that's where you're gonna excel and thrive and impress the socks off of everybody, uh, and do good things. So um, let's see. We have uh, a couple hands up. Yeah. Um, should we answer? All right. Um, Catherine Bozzini, um, if you still have a question. Um, I think. Are you able to unmute yourself or? Hi, I apologize. I was in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no 
You guys actually already answered my question. I was wondering about volunteer opportunities, especially during COVID. Okay. So thank you. I got a lot of information from that. Good, terrific. Oh, great. Um, let's see, uh, Faiza. Um, hi. Hi, my name is Faiza. So my one of my question was um, due to this ongoing COVID situation, um, and especially. Um, we don't know how, how long it is gonna last. Do you think that medical school would now start paying more attention to um, academic stuff than volunteering stuff? Because volunteering has been limited. Um, that's one of my questions. The other question is, um, I would definitely love to know more about RotoCare. Um, so um, I don't know how I can contact um, RotoCare. So, so um, reach out to me at biology at sfsu.edu and I'll send you some information. Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, do you, do you guys think academics would, would be considered um, more um, than volunteering as the medical situation goes on? Um, I can maybe speak on this. So I think currently all of us, you know, volunteered and got involved prior to COVID, obviously. Um, so, but I know from talking with other programs and stuff like that in other schools and just having alumni that I speak to on the boards, um, they're not really sure how COVID is going to impact their application cycle um, and that it's an ever-changing um, criteria that they're looking at. So um, honestly, I don't think I, I mean, I personally can't answer that exactly, but I think as long as you show interest in something that is consistent, like they want to see that you've been involved with anything maybe over a long period of time um, or just like that it wasn't just a I did this for two days and then I stopped um, and that you're just authentic in your application and that the strengths that you put forward might not be medically related, but they highlight who you are. Um, I think that would outweigh, you know, the lack of volunteer during COVID. Um, yeah. And my second question is for this um, site 239 class, um, is it going to be only available for the spring of 2021 or is going to be available after that also? Um, we hope that it will be available thereafter. We're not sure if it'll be just once a year, or if it'll be both fall and spring. Um, but if it's well enrolled, I expect that we'll be able to roll it up, you know, in fall and spring. We just have to see. Um, so do you think, because I'm a freshman right now, is it is it right for me to take the psych class? Because it's yeah. quite a long time until I take the med school route. So, yeah. I think it'd be great. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go back to the, the Q&A questions for a little bit. We'll come back to hands as, as in a little bit. Um, so for Rachel, we had a question about the post -back program. Could you say a little bit more about what that is and how to get into that and all that stuff? Sure, sure. So the post -back program um, essentially prepares, helps prepare students to apply to health professional schools. So it's post back. So it's after your bachelor's degree. Um, and it, we offer courses, um, that are the prerequisite courses. So some of those basic sciences like general chemistry, uh, introductory biology, et cetera, as well as upper division science courses. So ultimately I did see a lot of questions even in the Q and A about GPA and what's a competitive GPA. Uh, and so just also to, to address that, that that's something that, that students sometimes do in post back. So uh, students can do this now. They don't have to wait for post back. So if you're an undergrad in any year, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, et cetera, um, you, it's never too late and you can go ahead and get started on that process. But um, if you've had your GPA or your grades have been kind of up and down due to different factors in your life, there's definitely an, uh, another opportunity to work on that. And so schools want to see like what we call an upward trend in your GPA so that if if you were to plot your GPA year by year and if it's kind of up down down up down um, an upward trend essentially means that it's up 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 for a certain period of time and that certain period of time varies a lot but you know anywhere from one to two years of consistent upward trend so um, that's something that students can do in post back if they've already graduated but like I said if they they do that before they graduate they can do that there too so one recommendation um, that I would also make to students um, is know your GPA and know your science GPA. 
So a lot of times um, that's something that's looked very heavily at in the application. And a lot of students know their overall GPA, but they don't know their science GPA. Um, and so you definitely want to, there's a lot of um, online spreadsheet calculators for that. When you're talking about science GPA, um, there's a few definitions, but the most common one, and I'll just put it in uh, to the chat is called BCPM. Um, that's what allopathic medical schools look at. And that stands for biology, chemistry, physics, and math. So every single biology, physics, math, chemistry course that you take go toward that GPA, uh, whether they are prerequisite or not. And medical schools, all health professional schools, actually PA, I saw pharmacy, they all look at that science GPA or that BCPM GPA. So um, definitely you want to make sure that you know that um, and see that. And that's what's going to uh, rather than a, a certain number, it's more about your trend. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so another question for panelists that's up there frequently is, um, how do I even begin to think about studying for the MCAT? What techniques did you use? What worked? What didn't work? What advice would you give? Any of that stuff? I can speak, I can speak to that. I think for, it's been a while since I last took the MCAT, which was in 2015. But what I really remember was that I limited the number of books and resources that I used. I used two. I just used a Princeton Review. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter which one you use. You can use Kaplan, Princeton Review. It doesn't matter which one you use. The important part is that you limit yourself to maybe one or two question banks and stick to a schedule. And the MCAT, reviewing for the MCAT is essentially a review of your pre-medical courses, your bio, your chemistry, organic chemistry and physics. And I understand there's now a new section for psychology. So I would say have a good solid foundation, do well in your classes. That'll set you up for having a good foundation for preparing for the MCAT. And then use one or two reference books that'll help guide your studies for the MCAT and do a lot of questions. Just do a lot of questions. Anybody else? Yeah, I, um, I'll just echo what Lawrence said. It's a lot of, uh, you have to practice a lot. I think practice is like the main um, thing that you need to make sure you stay on top of because it's, uh, it's a test unlike any other test you've probably taken in terms of uh, like difficulty and the length that you're just sitting in front of a screen. Um, you know, answering questions. Um, and <laughs> for me, yeah, I also made sure to stick to, I also use Princeton, um, but I made sure to stick to their books and try and really go through everything that they had uh, like in the books comprehensively, um, making the most of those books. Um, but I think finding practice is like the main um, it should be a top priority. Practice questions, practice tests as well. Um, yeah, uh, I would say start to identify what kind of learner you are because not everyone learns the same. So some people might benefit from going to an in-person MCAT review while others might benefit from just obtaining the book and doing practice questions. Um, I bought the Kaplan book series that had the videos. Um, so I thought that was helpful to where if there was a concept I didn't understand um, in the book, it would have a supplemental video to watch. Um, and I just kind of studied at my own pace, but lots and lots of practice questions. Get your stamina up, your reading, cause you're gonna do blocks of, I, I don't know if you remember how many it was, 40 questions blocks. Um, and that is not gonna go away. Even in medical school, we have our board exams or step one. Uh, step one was nine hours, you know, sitting in front of a computer. So I think building good study habits early will definitely help you carry through the MCAT. Um, so yeah. Yeah, if I could just touch on uh, what Jeremy said, figuring out what kind of learner you are, I think is really important, whether that's um, speaking to yourself alone in your room or just going to a whiteboard and writing everything down that, um, you know, concepts that you want to internalize. Um, I think that is really the most helpful and will help you as you go into medical school. Um, I mean, I do want to say that, you know, don't get so frightened <laughs> with this MCAT test. I know it is a large test and it is uh, of, you know, great importance, but there are additional tests that you will be taking in medical school. So it's not going to end there. Don't stress yourself um, to death over this. Um, and I would say from um, 
my medical curriculum, it, I, it wasn't exactly like the MCAT, you know, so I got through the MCAT, I went to medical school and my tests were a bit different. And here I am second year medical student and I'm doing okay. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. I have a question, maybe, maybe some of you would know, maybe not, but maybe Rachel would know. What kind of advice do you have for a DACA student who's trying to get into medical school? Yes, so there's a few resources that I would recommend. And I actually did just answer one of these in the Q&A. So there is a group called Pre-Health Dreamers, and this is for students um, with or without DACA status. So it's for students with undocumented status. They provide a lot of really great resources, um, link information to scholarships, which are really hard to come by, as you know, um, for students with undocumented status. Um, so I would highly recommend um, joining that group. It's a listserv and they have um, a lot of really great um, resources. Additionally, our uh, Dream Resource Center on campus does have a lot of um, general advice and help um, not, not always just only for medical school, but for all um, navigating different things. Um, and then also looking into which schools accept, you can actually look into um, uh, on the AAMC websites, you can find out which schools tend to accept what are considered international students. And that's the, the, um, the category into which um, those students would fall. Um, so looking into those resources for, for international students as well. And then um, any tips from you guys about interviewing? What was that whole process like? What, how, did, how did you prepare for that? I can speak to that. So I had a mentor who was willing to sit down and work with me through some commonly asked questions in medical school. What I would recommend is to have an answer for why medicine that's gonna be the most common question you're gonna get asked in all of your medical school interviews. And try to practice not just by yourself, but identify a mentor who's willing to sit down, spend some time with you and go through some of the reasons why you go, why I wanna go into medicine, as well as some common questions. Others, I mostly use Google. I Googled uh, some commonly asked interview questions and practice myself in front of the mirror. Um, and just to remember that different schools have different interview styles. So some might have one-on-one -on -one interviews, might some, some have been switching to the multi-mini interviews to where you're being interviewed in a small group of other medical students who are just as nervous to get the same questions and everybody's on edge. So I didn't think also just like taking a big breath and just don't forget who you are. Don't get so caught up on a rehearsed answer that it comes off as like not authentic or that if they throw a curveball and they're like, what do you like to do for fun? You take five minutes to think of something you do for fun because you've been rehearsing all these medical questions. So I think just like stay true to yourself and, you know, just take a big breath. It'll, it'll be okay. Yeah, I would also like to add, um, you know, if there are any things in your transcript that you think are not perfect or that the um, interviewer asks you about, um, be honest, you know, be candid about it, speak to what happened, be honest and just, um, you know, share what you have learned from that experience or how you overcame, you know, whatever hurdle that was that led you to a C in physics or, you know, something like that, you know, have those answers ready too. Yeah. I'm sure they would ask if it's, um, you know, it's a possibility that they'll ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think I think like the main thing is uh, making sure that you turn like negatives into positives, I guess. And so, really, if you're going to talk about um, like a setback or an obstacle you had, making sure that you emphasize um, like how you overcame it and what you learned and what you're doing, like how how you've changed, I guess, from whatever it is that you that you overcame. I think that's that's important, and not just getting um, not just like talking about you know how how you're set back um, but really making sure that you talk about how you overcame that um, because they you know they want to see that um, you're able to handle like difficult situations and, and move forward thank you for that
I want to return to the, um, some of our participants have their hands up. So Joshua Florence, I'm going to allow you to talk. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes. Um, hey, how are you guys doing? Um, I wanted to know the about the volunteering program that you guys were discussing earlier. Um, are those, um, what am I trying to say? Are those online programs? Or are those all in-person programs? Because um, during COVID, it's been really hard to actually find um, volunteer programs that are um, still in person. And like, I'm um, personally not in San Francisco at the time. So because of COVID and everything is online. So I wanted to know if um, you guys knew or if these were online programs or um, online volunteering experience that I could get during COVID. Are you speaking about the LEAP program and the other one that was mentioned or just hospital program in general? Yeah, I'm not speaking about anyone in particular. Um, I like wrote down all of them, but just like in general, because like for my situation, I'm not in San Francisco. So if these all, um, programs are like in person based during this time that we're not um, learning um, in school, but online, then I had um, then I would personally like would like to know about online volunteering programs. I can speak to LEAP. LEAP is being led by a wonderful woman named Marcella Anthony, and LEAP is fully virtual at the moment. They're still recruiting and they're, st they're fully virtual. So uh, the coordinator herself is actually in Hawaii right now. So yeah. There you go. And somebody else just posted, uh, Eleni posted in the chat box that um, volunteermatch.org is a good place to look for both online and in-person opportunities. And I'd suggest that wherever you are, if you wanna find something local where you are that's face-to-face -to, -face, to reach out to your Department of Public Health, your local hospitals and um, all sorts of community organizations that doesn't have to be a San Francisco organization. We just listed those because those are the local ones, but it can be anywhere. Okay. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, very good. So our next um, question will be from um, Manuel Luna. Yeah, Manuel Luna. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I want to say, hey, Professor Small, did not know you were here. Nice to see you. <laughs> Second of all, my question is, um, as difficult it is to live in the Bay, I got to work. So I've tried to integrate the uh, um, background of medical wise into my work. So now I'm a EMT. Um, when you when you apply for schools, does it look better t um, between like research, um, volunteering, and then work as a in the medical background? What would personally look better between the three? Because as much as I would love to spend my time volunteering, which I used to do in high school, I got to pay bills now. I got to you know, try to maintain my housing situation. So is there a way to kind of like combine them both or get like like a little middle ground and still look good? Uh, Manuel, can I touch on this? Yeah, for sure, Professor. Um, um, I would like to say that I uh, had a similar experience and I actually worked as a front desk clerk in um, San Francisco while I was in undergrad. And, you know, my advice to you would just, if, if you do have to balance those things, you know, continue whatever job is gonna pay the bills and, you know, keep your grades up and, um, and do all that, but pick something, whether it is volunteering or whether it is research or, you know, working as an EMT to gain more money, do something that you're gonna love to talk about something that you're just gonna love in general because your time is is important. And I think that where you spend that time um, is, is gonna speak volumes to your um, interviewer when you apply for medical school. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll speak, speak on this too. I actually did work also during undergrad. I 
work like sometimes 30 hours a week and then was taking a full load. It was, you know, in San Francisco, it's a very unique cir circumstance because everything's so expensive. So a lot of the students at SS State like work and go to school. Um, if you could find maybe like one day a month or maybe like one day every two weeks to volunteer somewhere, uh, it's not about how many hours you volunteer, but I think they want to see consistency. Like you've been volunteering with this organization for the last six months. Um, because when you apply, you're not going to put like a quantity of hours, like, oh, I was here for 500 hours, but rather like, oh, I've been here for this length of time. And this is what I did. And this is, you know, I really enjoyed doing this. So um, I think that's one way to balance is not feeling like you have to volunteer twice a week for the next six months, but finding an organization that you could donate like one day a month to maybe something on your off day. Um, and then, you know, just making it a long term thing will also be just as effective in, on your uh, application. Awesome, thank you, thank you. All right. And uh, sorry, just to add to that, I actually just wanted to tell you, Manuel, that being an EMT is very valuable experience in medical school. I have a lot of classmates who were prior EMTs and sometimes I wish I did work as a scribe or as an EMT because like it really introduces a lot of the medical jargon and lingo that we use in medical school. So I would say it's a very valuable experience. Don't sell yourself short. Thank you for the praise, Lawrence. I really do appreciate it. It means a lot. Terrific. Um, next we have Hamed. Sammy. Yes, hi. Hi there. Thank you. Um, first off, uh, thank you for setting all this up. Um, shout out to Rachel Small. I miss being in Gen Chem with you. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for um, giving their two cents and giving feedback. Um, I wanted to know, so, you know, as an applicant or a prospective applicant building themselves, uh, their like, you know, portfolio, their background, all that stuff. Um, I'm trying to understand the utility uh, from a medical school perspective of like, like these volunteers not the volunteer opportun opportunities that everyone's talking about, but things like clubs and like organizations that are like primarily around like, oh, we want, we're all a bunch of like pre-med students and we all want to go to medical school. So we're all in this um, club together. I, I'm trying to understand, like wrap my head around what use that has for um, medical schools themselves. Um, a lot of the a lot of the applicants um, that I speak to and like my peers, they tend to have a very um, tunnel vision view of going into medical school and um, creating themselves as an applicant tends to be more important than what they're really doing. Like people volunteering in food banks, not because they want to give people food, but because they want to write on their application that they volunteered in food banks. So what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, how, what is the value in um, something like uh, joining like a medical, a pre-med student club uh, for medical schools? And as an applicant, how can I incorporate things that I would do just out of my own desires and goals and align it closer to something that, you know, having a balance of like, oh, I want to help people, but also I'm not just doing this because I want to throw it on application. I feel like that's a good question. Um, medical schools can see when you're involved in a club, if you're just putting it to fill a box on an application, or if you can speak on what you actually did during your time at that club. I say don't get involved in a club just to put it on your application, unless you have aspirations to get involved with the club, join the e-board and plan events. Because when you apply, you want to be able to be like, I'm in this club, it's a pre-med club. And we did all these great fundraisers and events for these local organizations. And we like did all this community outreach. Like, um, so I feel like that's really important, but it all depends on what club, because some clubs might not do that. So finding one that fits your goals. And if you can't find one that fits your goals, create one. I think that would be super good on application. Like I wanted to create this club because I'm interested in it and it has an uh, impact in people's health. And so I started this and I got a group of students together and we went out and we did this in the community. Um, that's my opinion. 
Yeah, I would echo what Jeremy said, to find your passion. If you do what you're passionate about, that will come through in any application and interview process. Um, so I wouldn't join a club just to say you joined a club. Um, it has to be something you feel really strongly about as you do about going to medical school. So find something that fits for you. Kind of just to give my, oh, sorry, go ahead, Winter. Go ahead, Lawrence, <laughs> you're good. So to give my two cents, I think I know what you're referring to. You're referring to what we normally call gunners in medical school. And I would learn to pick who my friends are. Um, what I would say is that it's very easy to be short-sighted and like what you said, tunnel visioned into doing things just for the sake of putting it on your application. Having said that, to dispel some myths here, you don't need to be part of a pre-med club not everyone needs to be the president of a pre-med club to get into medical school. You don't need to do this thing. What's important is that you're committed to a cause and you've dedicated a significant amount of time and passion into something that you really are interested in. It doesn't have to be related to medicine even. I know a lot of people who dedicated so much time into becoming musicians and they got into medical school and they were my classmates. Know a lot of people who really love baking and they got into baking competitions and that was the, that was their experience so whatever your passion is that's what makes you unique and really interesting as a person i'm not looking for the next person who's like the hundredth president of their pre-med club i'm looking for someone who's human and would love to care for other humans as a doctor yeah thank you lawrence well said and so i yeah, see oh go ahead oh sorry let me add just one thing, um, similar to what Lawrence was saying, just really echoing that 100%. Um, the fact that you can run any club of your choice or, you know, join a club that you are passionate about. Um, at San Francisco State, there is an EOP program that I was involved in for first generation college students. And that really doesn't have anything to do with science um, or, you know, pre-health for that matter. Um, but it was something that I chose to become a part of because I felt like I belonged there and um, there were a lot of counseling services that helped and I was the president of that club, but um, basically what I did is I took those skills and I went to medical school and I became a president of a surgery interest group so and I became, uh, I was able to run two drink clinics for a lot of the medical students there so that was a lot of fun and basically what I took from that was um, leadership skills. So it doesn't have to always be pre-health um, oriented. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Winter. So some great perspectives from our panelists. I wanna tick off a couple of questions that are kind of on the academic-y side real quick, and then we'll get back to the panelists. One was if I retake a class, do both my grades, um, are both my grades calculated towards science GPA? The, the better grade is the one that goes into your science GPA. There's a grade forgiveness policy, um, Rachel. Uh, no, sorry, that, that's, um, there is no grade forgiveness. There used to be for osteopathic medical schools, but they don't, they don't do that anymore. So oh, all okay. they go toward your GPA. Okay, so the grade forgiveness is internal, but not external. See, I learned something new here. It's good that we have lots of people on this panel. Um, is there a certain amount of times a person can take the MCAT? Will it look worse on an application if you take it lots of times? Um, and so what one of our panelists said last time was that you should take the MCAT when you feel that you are ready to take it, not to take one as a practice and that sort of thing, because they will all show up. And so um, even though you can do better later, all of your attempts will show up on your record. I'm just, I see nod, heads nodding. So that seems like agreement there. And then one other I'd like to tick off before we go back to the panelist was um, what if you're a senior and you haven't really gotten to know a professor well enough to ask for a good le a re letter of recommendation, even if you did well in their course? It's time to cultivate that letter of recommendation. You need to reach out to those professors that you're going to ask for letters from, say, can I have some time to meet with you? It's been a while since I had your class. So I'd like a re letter of recommendation. Can we meet and talk about my goals and, you know, figure out if you can write me a strong letter? but they need to know you well enough to write a really strong personal letter of recommendation. And so now I would reach out now. If you're not a senior, I would be reaching out to professors who you might 
cultivate, you know, several times a semester while you're in their courses and be curious, ask questions and talk about your goals, your plans, your dreams and um, all of that. But it's super important to cultivate those letters of recommendation. Do any panelists have um, suggestions about how you cultivated letters of recommendation? Just being involved in your classes. Don't come in, sit in the back, do your work and leave, you know, be involved, engaging in discussion. Um, because when you ask for a letter of recommendation, medical schools can tell between an authentic good letter and just a general letter that seems to be copy and pasted for a lot of people. And I feel like there's nothing worse for an application than a bad letter of recommendation that doesn't feel authentic. Yeah, um, I would say, you know, if you are the, the shy type and you are sitting in the back, go to those office hours, um, reach out over email, over Zoom now, which is readily available. Um, you know, don't feel like a weirdo because they're there to help. Um, there was a conference I went to and I was really excited about the speaker. I um, kind of stalked the speaker afterwards, kind of hung around. It was really weird. And I was going against every bone in my body like this is not right. Um, but, you know, I met up with the, with the speaker afterwards and it, she was a surgeon at UC Davis and I got to shadow one of her surgeries because of that. And it, it felt so weird and wrong, but I got her email and I kept in touch. And I think just doing little things like that is, is gonna make a difference. Cool. Any other yeah, I'll, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll just um, echo what Winter said. I'm, I definitely consider myself more on the shy side. And so I think um, it, it was way easier for me to like talk to professors slash ask questions um, during office hours. Um, so that, I think that was something that helped me a lot. Um, get to know my professors and build a better relationship. Okay, and I see people in the, the Q&A box still asking about when to take the MCAT. And so Brianna kind of went through that, but maybe the panelists can speak to when should you take the MCAT relative to applying, relative to starting medical school? Um, yeah, I, I, oh, Rachel, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. One thing that I would highly recommend is um, checking out the MCAT calendar, the AAMC, and I'm actually trying to pull that up right now. Um, uh, but so one thing about the MCAT is um, a lot of times people, I think, want to um, like they want to take it junior year or sophomore year or whatever. Um, I always it really depends. Um, you want to have completed those main prerequisites. So that year of biology, year of general chemistry, year of organic chemistry, uh, year of physics and biochemistry. Biochemistry figures into the into the the post 2015 MCAT hugely. So uh, biochemistry is almost like a necessary course now. Um, so it's after you've taken those and when you have space in your schedule. So just like a lot of folks were saying, MCAT is um, kind of like a marathon I liken it to. It's not something that you're gonna wake up one day and run um, 20, 26 miles. You have to really condition yourself for it. And that's why it takes months of study. So um, in non COVID years, usually the MCAT is required um, for any review. So I kind of, I'm gonna answer that how I normally would. Um, so usually I'd say like the latest possible time to take it before um, an application of that year, I usually recommend around May um, so that you can have your, your results back by your primaries, hopefully in early summer, mid summer by, um, that you're sending those in. Um, but once you do take it, your scores are generally valid for three years from that time. So. Um, that's why I usually say kind of doing it when you have space. So sometimes people do this, um, you know, in their senior year when they might have a little lighter course load or after they've graduated in between um, preparing for like the next steps. Um, so that's what uh, I would recommend in terms of timeline. Uh, and Jeremy, if you wanted to go ahead now. <laughs> I was just going to say, just don't take it before you feel that you have the courses out of the way that organic cam, everything, because it, it all comes up. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's see, Aureli, your hand was up. Yes, I want to thank you all for um, taking some of your time to uh, give us a lot of helpful advice. Um, and one of my questions is um, more towards the financial side of um, going into med school. And I did notice on the 
uh, PowerPoint how like the application process itself is like $3,000, which sounds like a lot. Um, and so medical school itself, I know it's, uh, it's expensive. So how are you paying for med school? Great question. Who wants to tackle that one first? I'll tackle it. I'll just go ahead. Um, so I was the one that said that the application was fairly expensive in my personal opinion. Um, I was somewhat non-traditional. Um, I started at SF or Sac State for a couple of years, took some time off, went to SF State and finished. Um, so I applied broadly to medical school. So I applied to 21 programs, which, yeah, <laughs> which ended up being almost like $14,000. And then I got 19 secondaries. So the way it works is you send out a primary application. And then if the school will send you a secondary and to fill that out and return it, they range anywhere from 90 to 130, I think was my most expensive secondary. Um, so all that factors into being like a couple thousand, three thousand dollars. Um, and then if you get interviews, obviously travel and hotel and which now it might be virtual. So who knows? Um, and then in medical school, I mean, I'm taking out student loans for medical school. I think the majority of people I know, um, I would say about 90% of the, my people I know are taking out student loans. Um, so like the graduate plus loans, and it does cover living at costs and everything. Um, so you don't really have to stress while you're in medical school because you can't do anything else but study, honestly, for 14 hours a day for your first two years, it seems like. Um, but that's my experience. Anybody else? Did I hear right that you said 14K for applications? No, wait, did I say that? No. I don't know. So to correct it was, what oh, you 1400 said. $1,400 for the initial primary, and then it was like an additional. Oh, okay. You know, okay. Total was like anywhere from twenty five dollars to $3,000 for the okay. applications itself. So between $2,500 and $3,000 for the. But program. I applied broadly. I applied to 21 programs, and I think most people a lot. try to narrow it down and apply to like. I don't know, 15, 10? I have no idea. Okay, very good. So anybody else have stories of uh, financing, financial aid, how you did it? Something I wanna add is that if you're applying for medical school, there is a WMC financial assistance programs that allows coverage for up to 15 schools for you. So that can help cut the cost for applying into medical school. As for the medical school itself, as Jeremy already mentioned, it's primarily student loans and which you will be, you know, most of these are subsidized, combination of subsidized and unsubsidized loans. And you can check out the websites of each of the schools you're applying into to see what their tuition fees are like for in-state and out-of-state applicants. Yeah, to touch on what Lauren said, I use the fee assistance program um, through, I, I believe it's FAFSA, and I was able to apply to 16 schools um, with that assistance. And then um, if I wanted to add additional, that would be up to myself. Um, so the fee assistance program was really helpful in my case. And then, you know, additionally, I am taking out loans for medical school right now. And um, that's just the name of the game, um, unfortunately, but uh, if, if this is something that you really want to do, this is, this is the route. And um, I believe at the end of the day, it will be worth it. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to say, I put into the chat the link for the AAMC fee assistance program if folks want to take a look there. Thank you. Yeah. Very helpful, because that's a big chunk of change for most of us. Um, let's see, our next question will come from Sandra. Yes, uh, hi, I would like to... Oh, hang on, sorry, that was me. You're back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so thank you all for organizing this event. We really appreciate this. Um, I would like to ask what are the like key uh, requirements courses taking for pre-med? Like I'm a freshman and majoring in biology, physiology. So I would like to know like what are the additional requirements courses for pre-med other than biochemistry, bio, general chemistry and general physics, general bio and organic chemistry. Anybody? I would say that there's, other than the prerequisites, there's no really 
hard required class that you need to take for medical school. It is advised that you take some upper division science classes such as biochemistry, cell biology, and more importantly, anatomy and physiology. But again, these are not set in stone. It depends on the school and it depends on your interest on the subject. I've known plenty of students who got into medical schools and got plenty of interviews by being a music major and they just took the minimum required classes for medical school. So the only thing you really need to take uh, is the one year of biology, one year of organic chemistry, one year of general chemistry and one year of physics. And so it's always a good idea just to look at the medical schools you're thinking of applying to and look at their requirements because there are some differences between schools. And so I encourage people to make a table with all your schools and list out all their requirements and then you can decide what courses you really need to take in order to apply for those schools. Let's see. Um, that was Sandra. We've got Catherine Flores up next. Hi. Um, so I have about like three questions. Um, um, so my first question, so I want to start medical school fall 2022, and I graduate next semester. Um, and so I'm looking at the MCAT um, test for next year, and I see that the last, it goes up to September. And I think if I'm not wrong, uh, applications for medical schools open on October, but I don't know if I misread that. Is that correct? Rachel, do you know anything? Sure. The so the um, AMCAS, which is for the allopathic medical schools, usually opens um, the end of May, um, and ACOMAS, which is for the osteopathic medical schools, opens mid-May or early May now. Um, so the first days that you can start to submit are either um, early June. Uh, so they taking the MCAT in September for that same year is actually taking it a little bit late. Um, for that application season, like I said, I normally recommend that students do it the, by the May of the year that they're trying to apply. So if you were looking to apply, uh, begin in fall 2022, then you'd want to be uh -huh. looking at applying in summer 2021 and having your MCAT done by summer okay, 2021. Okay, by summer 21. Okay, so how about like taking it by June? Would that be too late or that would be good? Uh, June's fine. It's like everything, you know, there's not any one set way to go through this. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh -huh. so when I say May, usually the idea is that uh, most often or during regular years, it takes four weeks to get your um, results back and your scores to be posted. And so that uh -huh. would mean um, the sooner that you get that back, the sooner you can make your strategy for applying. So usually in June, it's, it's getting a little later, but it's not too late. Definitely not. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then, um, my other question was about the post -bac program. So let's say that I want to start doing a, I want to start with the post -bac next year. Would that still like allow me to um, start medical school in fall 2022? Well, um, so when you apply, you apply the year before essentially that you matriculate. And so you want, uh, if there's any particular work that you need to do on your application by, um, so if, by attending a post program, if you need to work on your GPA, um, if you do that um, subsequent, like at the same time that you apply, then you can send an update to schools, but they won't see necessarily the work you've done. So what, what yeah. you generally want to do is undertake that work, work on the GPA, and then apply once you have shown an upward trend. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, so we're getting close to our time to sign off, but I wanted to pull up one more question from the Q&A, and this will be our last one. And so the question is, when applying, did any of the panelists see themselves as a non-traditional applicant? If so, how? And this person says, I think a big source of anxiety for themselves is not seeing themselves as the ideal applicant, so they want to hear your stories. Um. Anyone else wants? I can speak on this. Uh, so I am the first one in my family to graduate college. Um, I didn't come from a heavily academic background. Um, and I actually started at Sac State, like I mentioned, for 
two years doing international business and then I stopped and then I went and worked and lived my life for about three years and then decided, you know what, I really need to go back to school in which I started at community college at CCSF and then transferred to state. So in terms of medical school timelines, I feel like my timeline was not traditional in any way. Um, but I think, you know, I applied broadly to medical schools in the US and I didn't get in. So I applied to Ross and I got in and I ended up starting like four months after that. And now I'm in my third year, I took my step one, um, which I did pretty well on. So, I mean, like comparing yourself like before medical school to just not thinking that you're an ideal candidate to now, I mean, I feel like you can do it and your passion and dictate how you feel like your future should go. Um, I don't know if I answered that correctly, but. There's no correct answers. Any other panelists? Do you see yourself as a non-traditional applicant? Absolutely. I was born and raised in the Philippines and I grew up there until I was 18. I was majoring in hospitality and I was, after two years of bartending and learning how to cook, I realized that I was in the wrong major. So I immigrated to, to the United States by myself and was able to transfer most of my credits to San Francisco State University. And then I was finally able to major in something that I'm interested in, which was physiology. And following that, I took a gap year. I took a year to work at Best Buy after undergrad to work in computers, because I also love computers and I love working in programming and building computers. And so in terms of feeling that like once you get into medical school, you realize like in my experience, it's you always feel that imposter syndrome creeping in because you feel a lot of people surrounding you coming from very prestigious backgrounds and you feel that, and do I belong? Did I get in just by luck or did I just one win the luck of the draw and just so happened that I got a good word in? And the answer is always, as long as you all have a good reason for why you want to pursue medicine and keep working hard and just focusing on why you want to practice medicine, then you will, you're, you will always belong where, where, you, where you get into. It doesn't matter where it is. The important part is that you have a strong reason for wanting to help people. And that's what I would say. So just stick to, stick to your gut and just pursue your path to medicine. Everyone is unique. Thank you, Lawrence. Any final stories? No, all right. Well, I see some uh, chat coming in thanking the panelists, which I will do again. Um, I really appreciate all of your insights and I learned something new today. I'm still ramping up on this, this med school advising business, even though once upon a time, the little thing you don't know about me is I was actually accepted to medical school and decided not to go. Um, and so here I am instead telling others, trying to help others figure out how to get there. Um, so thank you all for coming. So Brianna will be posting this recording as well as the PowerPoint slides on our biology website. So biology.sfsu.edu. And um, Brianna is not a pre-health advisor, but we'll do our best to get you pointed in the right directions. If you reach out to biology at sfsu.edu, we'll try to uh, at least for biology majors, we'll get you pointed in the right direction. And for other majors, you know, reach out to folks in your department and maybe Rachel might know how other departments are doing their pre-health advising a little bit more. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And um, we'll be doing this again. We'll probably, we'll give you, we'll send you a follow-up survey to see your ideas about future webinars. And um, we'll be doing this again in probably a couple of months um, is my guess. And so, have a great rest of your Monday. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. You can do this. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Rachel. All right. Great presentation. Yeah, yeah this is great. So, and I learned stuff. All right, so um